Welcome to Friendly Words, the sermon podcast of Pratt Friends Church in Pratt, Kansas. The message you're about to hear was originally preached at Pratt Friends Church on Sunday, August 21st, 2022. It focuses on using passages from the Bible to guide prayer. The message to all who will listen is when you don't know how to pray, find a word from God and pray it back to Him. Now, here is Pastor Mike Neifert. Anybody here ever felt at a loss for words in a social situation? Oh, yeah. You've met a stranger, said, hey, how are you, introduced yourself, stood there awkwardly shaking their hand and not known what to say next. Maybe it's even happened once or twice when you've seen a stranger at church. That ever happened? Yeah? Yeah. Maybe it's also happened with a friend. You've been at a restaurant talking about this and that and the other thing, and then you got nothing, they've got nothing. What do you do? These things often resolve themselves pretty quickly, but in the seconds which feel like minutes of silence, it's a little awful, isn't it? You don't want them to feel like you don't care about them or like you don't have anything to say, but that's where we're at. And God helps us through those things, I'm sure. I recently picked up some tips from Vanessa Van Edwards, founder of Science of People during the Global Leadership Summit, which I attended online a few weeks back. Her talk was about how to connect with people on a deeper level. And she shared 15 great questions to get beyond, hey, how are you, and what do you do, what's your job, where do you live, things like that. So we're going to talk about some of them. I'm not going to talk about all 15, but I'll give you just some examples of these moving deeper, connecting deeper queries that she offered. Have any fun plans this weekend? Or today, or tomorrow, or whatever. What book or movie or TV character you most like? I think I'm Magnum P.I., don't you? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. What's weighing on your heart or mind? What's the proudest moment of your life? How do you feel most misunderstood? Whew. Now, admittedly, you probably aren't going to ask a complete stranger some of those questions on the first time you meet them, like, how do you most feel misunderstood? But some of them could help you, like, you have any fun plans for this weekend? Could help move a little bit closer. But all of these, all of these can help us in our friendships, it could help us in marriage, and all those relationships that sometimes we have, that communication cycle stall. We can use these things to find out about people and encourage them to talk and open up. Let me ask the first question that I posed way back at the very beginning of this message in a slightly different context. Have you ever felt at a loss for words in a prayer time? Not knowing exactly how to pray. You're talking with God and you just don't know what to say, how you should pray, if what you're asking is something that God would want for you. Yes? Here's the good news. God knows what you need before you ask, and he's going to work out what his will for you despite your stuttering and stammering, stilted and stopping prayer life. You can't mess things up. Not really. Here's more good news. There is a way to find words to pray when you don't know what to pray. And no, it doesn't involve asking God if he has any fun plans for the weekend. (laughs) He does, by the way. I am sure that he enjoys every weekend when everybody's praising him and worshiping him together in the church. I am sure that he finds greater pleasure in the church shouting praises and singing praises to him and hearing his word and then going out and obey far more pleasure than even the most enthusiastic among us ever have oh that we would anticipate worship and being together with the church the way that god does coming back to the good news concerning the way of knowing what to say for prayer are you interested yeah Even if you don't often struggle to find words when talking with God, I think you'd be all ears for another way to express your heart to him. You've got a Bible somewhere near you. Pick it up. Like a real Bible with pages and 
binding, not your phone. You always have that in your hand. I want you to feel the weight of that. Let it rest on your lap, maybe. Just feel the weight of that book. What we have here is God's revelation of himself to us so that we can know him. We can know what he wants, what he desires for us. Isn't that crazy? You can hold it in your hands. We know God in part because he's given us this book. Do we know him outside of this book? Of course we do. The Holy Spirit is alive and active in our world. He speaks to us and he he guides us each and every day. He says, go this way or go that way. He says, say this. And sometimes he says, don't say that. (laughs) But this book is important to our understanding of who God is. And our relationship with him comes in part because we read this word and the Holy Spirit speaks, us in, speaks it into our heart. Isn't that true? So, if that's true, if this book tells us what God is like, if it tells us how he acts, what his desires are, couldn't we borrow words from this book to guide us as we pray? Actually, that's what we've been doing or what I've been teaching you to do over the last two or three times we've been together. When we talked about how to pray for different groups, how to pray for the lost and how to pray for your fellow church mates, I don't know if that's the right word, believers, how to pray for pastors, we've been talking about God's word and how it can guide us in our prayers for those groups. Let me remind you of the the first example that I gave when we were talking about praying for the strained folks. The first prayer I invited you to pray for your lost friends and family members was based on a single verse. I read more verses around it, but today we're going to just read that single verse, 2 Corinthians 4.4. And this is what it says. The God of this age, and that's the devil... This is our enemy. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. After reading that verse, if you remember, I showed you how to pray concerning the blinded state of unbelieving neighbors and coworkers and the like. In light of the fact that God is the only one who can reverse spiritual blindness, I urged you to pray something like this. God, my strained friend, cannot see the goodness of your son or grasp what you've done to make salvation available to him because the devil has blinded him. Please thwart the enemy's plans. Open my friend's eyes so he can see and believe. And I hope that you've been praying that over your unbelieving friend. Remember, we have this chest up here. The chest is here to remind us to be praying for those who are not yet believers. And we have lots of names in there, people that we're praying for. Keep praying for them. So that's what praying scripture looks like. It's read a verse, understand it, and then adapt it and pray it back to God, the one who inspired that verse in the first place. Knowing what God has revealed guides us to pray in line with what he wants. Don't you see it when you read 2 Corinthians 4? 4? Don't you just hear that shouted invitation? Pray for those who are blinded. It's an invitation to pray against Satan's blinding work. Let me show you an example of how Daniel prayed God's word back to him during Israel's time in Babylon. You know Daniel, right? He was the one that kept praying despite the king's command and ended up in the lion's den, and the lions suddenly couldn't open their mouths and chomp on him. And he had those three friends, remember? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. That were in the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down. You know Daniel. All right. Before I go into his prayer, let me read a verse or two or five from Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 4 through 11. That's actually more than five verses, isn't it? Eight. We're going to read some verses here from Jeremiah 25. And it's here that we see God say something about the exile of his people how long they were going to have to endure because of their wickedness. The revelation God gives about his people when they're about to be sent away is very specific. So listen to what God speaks through Jeremiah. Again, I'm reading eight verses. Jeremiah 25, 4 through 11 says this, The Lord has sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and again. You have not listened or paid any attention. They said, Turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave you. 
and your ancestors forever and ever. Do not follow other gods or serve and worship them. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Then I will not harm you. But you did not listen to me. Where Verse 7. You did not listen to me, declares the Lord, and you have aroused my anger with what your hands have made, and you have brought harm to yourselves. Therefore, the Lord Almighty says this. This is Jeremiah speaking for God. Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. When Daniel reads Jeremiah's words, and there's another verse in chapter 29 that says the same thing. When Daniel reads Jeremiah's word and zeroes in on what this much ridiculed and rejected prophet said concerning the length of time Babylon would rule over God's people, he gets excited. If you'll turn to Daniel chapter 9 now, we're going to read a little bit longer passage than usual so that you can see how Scripture can kickstart prayer. In Daniel chapter 9, at the beginning of the chapter, Daniel encounters God's word given by Jeremiah, and he's prompted as he reads to pray to God. Follow along. I'm going to read the first 19 verses of chapter 9. Daniel starts this chapter with a setup of the story, and then he records the prayer that he prayed. So here we go. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God and kept his laws he gave us through the servants of prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us. Because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open our eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Whew. Why are God's people exiled? It's because of their sin and wickedness, right? 
Daniel reads Jeremiah's prophecy and it prompts confession of wickedness and a plea for mercy. He knows that the 70 years is just about up. And he prays for mercy. Daniel prays for relief because he knows that God is God. And because it's been almost 70 years since the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon's horde, he knows that God's about to act. He believes what God said through Jeremiah. And he's calling on God to fulfill his promise in mercy to bring about the overthrow of the enemy who holds his people captive. When you and I read promises of Jesus' return and predictions of making all things right, could we not, as believers, pray for a quick return? Pray for that eternal deliverance? Of course we can. We should. John, at the very end of the book of Revelation, a vision of what is to come, was prompted by what he saw and he heard in prayer. And here's what he said in the penultimate verse of that book, Revelation 22, 20. It says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> we ought to pray that almost every day. Maybe every day. Maybe every hour sometimes. Oh, Lord, come. Do you know how many promises there are in the Bible? How many promises from God to people? Not just people promising each other stuff because they almost always fall apart. But this is God promising. You know how many there are? Over 7,000. Can you pray all of them for yourself or for others that you know? Probably not every one of them. Some are very specific to a person. Like he promised Abraham that through all nations he would be blessed. You're not Abraham, right? But there are other promises that God makes to people that still apply to us. A great number of them are promises that God makes that you and I can apply to our own lives in the 21st century. When we read them in context, understanding they are for us, we can pray them, giving thanks to God and trusting him to fulfill them in our lives. Let me give you an example. Flip on over to the New Testament, to the book of Philippians, a letter which Paul wrote while he was in prison. He talks in chapter 1 over and over about the chains that he's in, so we know that he was in prison. Before he gets to that, though, he says the following to the church in Philippians 1, 3 to 6. There's a promise in the paragraph, so pay attention to it. You may have heard it before. Here's what it says. Philippians 1, 3 to 6 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So what's the promise? God's going to finish the work he started in each of us. God will bring to completion the work that he's begun in each member of his church, in each child of God who's been adopted into God's family. He's going to do it. He's going to bring it to completion. Whatever needs to get done in your life, you're going to get it done. You're going to get her done. I heard myself saying that. I thought, oh, yeah. God's going to do it. He's going to bring to completion. We don't have to worry and fret. We can rest in him and continue to do whatever the Spirit gives us. Because Paul is confident in this truth, we can pray for God's continued work in our lives with sureness, with faith. Paul's words, which God inspired, grow our faith. We can speak our trust to him, something like this. Lord, I hear what you say through Paul about completing the good work that you've begun in me. Please keep working. Bring about the good in my life that you want to complete. I submit to your work as I await the day when I get to see Jesus face to face. Can you trust God to do that? Sure. That's a promise that we can trust him for. We can be confident. Confident means with faith. You understand this, don't you? You can find the promises of God and pray them over your situation or over the circumstances of a friend. You can remind God of what he said and ask him to act in the way that he says he's going to act. 
in reality, every time someone prays to receive salvation, they're praying God's word back to him. They may not know the exact words, but they're just claiming the promise that God says, if you confess your sins, you're going to be set free. If you believe in me, you're going to have eternal life. We're, we're praying those words back to, to him. We're confessing Jesus as Lord and believing that he can save us. That's how we gain salvation is by trusting the promises of God and praying them back to him. Let me show you another example of praying God's word back to him. This one's found in the New Testament, book of Acts. In the first verses of chapter 4, Peter and John are being tried before the Sanhedrin, a religious ruling body. This is the same group of men who tried and convicted and condemned Jesus to death. They command Peter and John, they command the disciples to stop preaching in Jesus' name. And then, because they don't know what else to do, they let him go. And these two go back to the church. Beginning at verse 23 of this chapter and reading through verse 31, we have a description of what happens when they show up at the church. There's a praying God's word moment, so let's look at it. Starting at verse 23... On their release, this is Acts 4, 23 to 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You saw how they prayed David's words, or God's words back to him. They saw these words, which are from Psalm 2, as a confirmation that they were on the right track because the rulers of the people, they were against them. More than that, the rulers of the people were against God. Can anybody defeat God? In fact, let me read the context of these verses. The quote is from Psalm 2, 1 and 2. I'm going to read 1 through 6 so we get a little bit of context here and just see what happens. See what we learn about God. Here's what it says, Psalm 2, 1 to 6. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. God sees the rulers and kings, the men whom people fear and respect, rising up against him, and he says, LOL. Isn't that what it says? It says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. <laughs> LOL. There's no one who can defeat God. So Jesus' followers, knowing the context, pray this passage back to God. The believers in Acts chapter 4, they bring the threats of the religious leaders to God's attention and ask him to deal with them. And then empowered by the Spirit, emboldened by, the, by God's word, they go right back out and do the thing that they've been commanded not to do. There's no slowdown in the gospel mission. Not even a little bit. The way the disciples pray and act can lead us to pray God's words about himself and his greatness back to him. We need reminders of how powerful the one we've given ourselves to is. Praying words about his excellence grows our faith and emboldens us. If God is for us, who can be against us? To close out, I want to read the first verses of Psalm 78. And then I'm going to pray God's inspired word back to him for those who have influence in the lives of children. That would be pretty much all of you. 
Hear God's words found in Psalm 78, verses 1 through 8. Starting at verse 1, Psalm 78, 1 through 8. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. So if you're a parent or a grandparent, a teacher, a coach, an aunt or an uncle, somebody that interacts with kids at any time, let me pray Psalm 78, 1 through 8 over you. And when we're done, we'll take just that a little bit of time of silence. You can use that time to pray a promise over a situation or pray a passage of praise back to God and ask with confidence for him to act. So let's just go back to Psalm 78 and let's pray together. God, we look at your word and we see what you've done. And we want the next generation to know these things. And so, God, put your words in our mouth as we speak to those who are younger than us that we might encourage them in following you. God, help us to tell the next generation your praiseworthy deeds, the things that you've done in our lives. Help us to have opportunities to share our testimony about the ways that you brought healing in our lives and the ways that you've changed our lives and the ways that you protected us. God, I pray that your word would continue generation after generation after generation in my family and in the families of those who are hearing and in all those who put their faith in you. It's that each generation would trust in you and remember your praiseworthy deeds and that you would show them that you're alive and that they would experience your deeds as well and your power. God, help us not to be stubborn and rebellious against you. Help us to be loyal to you. Help us to be faithful to you. God, give us opportunities this week to speak of the praiseworthy deeds of our God so that the next generation might know. God, I pray that you'd help us to put into practice what we learned today. Help us to pray your word when we don't know how else to speak to you. Remind us of your promises and remind us of your greatness and give us confidence in prayer. Throughout this week, every situation we come into in, uh, that comes across our path, every person who we talk with, I pray that you'd give us words to pray over them and pray over the situations that we we face. Thankful that you give us your word and that your spirit's with us and that your spirit uses your word to accomplish your purposes in us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you have been encouraged and challenged by today's sermon. If you want to hear each week's message, be sure to subscribe to Friendly Words in your podcast app. May God bless you as you follow Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit.